Good morning and welcome to the 33rd meeting of the Criminal Justice Committee in 2024. We have apologies this morning from Pauline McNeill. So our first item of business is to ask the committee to agree to take item four in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. So our next item of business is to consider uh, our pre-budget scrutiny and our focus today is on the courts, prosecution service and prisons. And so we've got two panels this morning. Our first panel consists of representatives of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Malcolm Graham, Chief Executive of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. And welcome to your new role and uh, John Lowe, Crown Agent uh, at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. So, very warm welcome to you both, and I refer members to Papers 1 and 2. Um, can I also refer members to the written submission from the FDA Union, which was circulated separately just recently, and which is relevant today to uh, our questioning of Mr Logue, and we thank the FDA Union for their submission. So I intend to allow around 75 uh, minutes for this panel, uh, and I'll begin by asking uh, our panel just an opening general question to set the scene, uh, and then we'll move on to <coughs> members' questions. And I'll maybe come to um, Malcolm Graham first and, and then John Logue. So the question is, um, what do you see as the main financial challenges facing your own organisation? And what is the latest position on any discussions with the Scottish Government on your budget for 2025 to 26? So I'll bring in Malcolm Graham. Morning, and Morning. thank you very much for the opportunity to give this evidence in support of the written submission um, that I put in last week. The challenges facing the justice sector uh, over the last number of years have been significant. Collaborating with justice partners and with support from the Scottish Government, SCTS has made real progress in addressing a number of them. For instance, we have reduced the number of scheduled criminal trials by over 20,000 from a pandemic high of 43,500. We have managed continually growing caseloads. Solemn case levels have grown by 36 per cent and tribunal business by 88 per cent over the last five years. We have delivered change and improvement as resources have allowed. For example, we have improved summary justice through the summary case management, pilots, reducing the level of trials that need to be called and the number of witnesses that require to be cited, 11,000 of whom were police witnesses. We have increased the number of evidence by commissioner suites in operation, minimising the potential for further trauma from victims and witnesses. There were approximately 700 hearings in 2023-24. And I expect that to be over a thousand uh, by the time we get to the end of this year. And we're well advanced in developing a trauma-informed workforce uh, uh, and developing improved models that put victims at the centre uh, of how the courts are run. In answer to your question, looking ahead to next year, there are many challenges that we need to address. And the criminal case modelling indicates a further increase in the number of solemn indictments coming our way. Tribunal business is continuing to grow, and the need to invest in people and systems so that we can deliver a service uh, has changed significantly in both function and size over recent years. Uh, I outlined in my written evidence that SCTS is facing both volume and financial pressures that are often out with our control. And to provide the same size and shape of service in 2025-26, as we have this year, will cost around an extra £14 million. Now, you asked about conversations with the government, uh, and at the moment uh, we've been asked to uh, put submissions in, which broadly reflects the submission that I've put into uh, this committee, but we've also been asked to look at what the potential of a flat cash settlement would bring. Mm -hmm. That would result in the need to reduce court and tribunal business programmes, and to postpone more or less all the changes that we've planned to improve services over the coming year. Mm -hmm. To give an indication of the impact on the courts, absorbing these pressures would be equivalent to removing 10 solemn trial courts, say four high court and six sheriff and jury courts 
with effect from April 2025. Now, as Members of the committee will be aware we have been in the, uh, the very positive position of receiving additional funding from the government under the RRT banner to ensure that mm -hmm. additional courts could be run mm -hmm. for what was the recovery programme from the pandemic. With solemn case levels growing, however, the impact of a flat cash settlement would be immediate and drastic. And our modelling indicates that victims, witnesses and the accused in the most serious cases could be waiting for more than three years to come to court for a trial. And this would be completely at odds with a commitment across the justice sector to reduce traumatisation for victims and, and witnesses uh, of crime. However, if we are able to secure the funding set out in our submission, then we will be able to continue investing in our people, our reform programmes, and perhaps most importantly, our joint work with justice system partners. These reforms will deliver further efficiencies for both the SCTS and the justice sector as a whole in the longer term. And most importantly, they will improve service quality for those who find themselves involved in the justice system through no fault of their own. So we're at a critical stage of making real changes to how the system operates, both to improve services and manage future pressures. Uh, and my conversations with the government have been uh, a plea to sustain that funding, which is going to be critical to ensure that we continue to make that positive progress and maintain uh, a sustainable and effective justice system in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Gosh, there was a lot in there, um, but very, 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 very helpful. Um, I'm going to bring in John Logue, and then I'm going to ask a follow-up question, if I may, just around... Um, multi-year funding. So I'll just come to you uh, straight away, John Logue. Uh, thank you, convener, and thank you for the invitation uh, to uh, discuss the, the, the next year's budget with the committee this morning. Um, in, in brief, I think all of the information that I, I, I think is, is relevant and important is in my letter mm -hmm. of last week, and so I wouldn't seek to rehearse any of that. I think I would describe the financial pressures in two ways by, by summarising them, that we have made in the justice system as a whole, we have made in the last year, I think, good progress in overcoming the, the effects of the pandemic on the criminal justice system. And we've also made good progress in relation to reform. Um, but in relation to both of those areas, there is still a lot of work to be done. And there is still a lot of work in the system as a result of the pandemic that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Mm. And reform is at a point where there are things that we might discuss in more detail this morning, for example, where we can point to um, real evidence of reform working that um, would match, I think, the ambition of the justice system as a whole, my ambition and the ambition of, of the prosecution service in Scotland to do more in that area. Mm -hmm. And the, the consequence in general terms would be that any restriction in funding in subsequent years would put both of those areas at, at risk in very general terms. It would take longer to overcome the impact of the pandemic and it would either take longer or prevent um, the sort of reform that we would all like to see. Mm -hmm. And in terms of your second question about um, discussions with the government, we're still in the process of those discussions. Those are ongoing, have not concluded, and therefore we still await um, an indication of what our budget um, would be in 25 26, but from previous years, that's a process that uh, I don't think is any different this year from previous years in mm -hmm. terms of, of progress with that. So I don't have any concerns in that, that area. Yeah. Okay, th thank you for that. And I think what was the standout in, in your submission was um, just in relation to the um, significant pressures arising from the investigations of deaths uh, and increasing numbers of post-mortems, which um, w w certainly caught my attention. I think both your submissions were very helpfully, uh, very detailed. Um, th there's a lot for members to come in on, so thank you for that. I wonder if I can maybe just um, come back to um, sort of funding provision uh, and multi-year funding. So um, you may be aware that the Finance Committee has been undertaking a similar process of pre-budget scrutiny and they've heard strong evidence from the likes of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, Audit Scotland and others that the Scottish Government should adopt a longer term approach to budgeting, including multi-year plans. And you know, that's nothing new um, in terms of this committee. 
Uh, and obviously that would offer greater flexibility for managing challenges, balancing future needs and so on. So from your perspective, and I'll, I'll come to Malcolm Graham and, the, and then back to John Logue, would you agree with this um, sort of analysis, if you like? And I'm just interested in um, perhaps a wee bit about how that model, uh, how a multi-year funding approach would support um, Scottish courts and tribunals. Thank you. Um, and as you say, this isn't a new conversation about multi-year mm -hmm. funding. In fact, it would be returning to a position that uh, you know we have enjoyed in public services at some point in the in the distant past. And understand the reasons why uh, multi-year funding you know hasn't been deemed to be possible uh, in, in the relatively recent terms. But I think what lies behind your question is what what would the advantages be if we mm -hmm. move back to that? Uh, and clearly, there would be advantages. What I would say, first of all, about the SCT budget is that we don't even really enjoy the privilege of being able to have a whole year of planning, because the way in which the budget is structured, which I hope is clear through the course of the submission, um, is that we get a budget through the budget bill, which is really only about 50 per cent of what we would forecast to spend. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, in almost equal part, the other two parts of the budget are made up from uh, court fees and fines recovered, uh, and then other in-year settlement that comes either in the autumn or the spring through the Scottish Government that are in relation to elements of the business that are highly variable uh, and still changing, a lot of it through tribunals that have been uh, devolved in recent times uh, and are still settling down. So that, that context, in some respects, makes it even harder to plan within a year, yeah. never mind moving okay. to, to multi-year planning. That said, um, both on uh, resource funding and on capital funding, uh, the requests that SCTS has made uh, have largely been met by the Scottish Government in recent years. Mm -hmm. And in relation to capital funding, for instance, the fact that we don't have multi-year funding settlements hasn't prevented us from, at times, being able to do multi-year planning, mm -hmm. um, because it's inevitable that you're not going to be able to uh, set out and achieve each of your capital projects on an annual basis, mm -hmm. um, because of the nature of the, uh, the, 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 the requirement for that expenditure to last over multiple years. So you work on the premise that the capital will come, and although the baseline budget for capital in SCTS has been at a very low level, of around seven or eight million. The actual capital settlements through the year have been more towards 17 or 18 million, which is the sustained level mm -hmm. and as an absolute minimum that we would need um, going forward. Multi-year settlements would offer much greater flexibility in terms of uh, the month-to-month -month variability in some of the expenditure that we have, both in terms of revenue and capital. Mm -hmm. I think it would reduce a lot of the management and administration overhead that comes in to, uh, to the annual budget setting process. There's a huge amount of time and effort, including from myself, uh, based on the annualised process of discussion and negotiation with Scottish Government, uh, all of the people in SCTS and indeed other organisations who work uh, to do that planning um, and, and to, to, to manage it. And then uh, the amount of effort that goes in to coming into budget effectively landing you know, uh, around £230 million on the head of a pin for the 31st of March every year is, is in some respects disproportionate to the benefits that it brings. It's a requirement as accountable officer that I do that, mm -hmm. but if we had multi-year planning, we would have greater flexibility perhaps not to have to put so much effort into you know, what, what, what ultimately um, at, at that stage would become more of a, a false exercise. The, okay. the final thing that I would say, and understand this is how it's been looked at uh, through the other structures that you refer to, is that if we're going to move to that, given the criticality and importance of everything that I hope I will emphasise, um, along with other colleagues in parts of the justice system and in this sector, if we're going to move to that, then we need to do it as a whole. Yeah. It needs to be a decision that is made so that we can take the benefits of that multi-year planning into our collaborative work, and it shouldn't be viewed as something that would apply to one organisation or another. Thank you for that. Okay, th thank you. Um, John Logue, is there anything that you would like to add to that, just from your perspective? Uh, no, thank you, convener. I think, I think Malcolm captures very 
general points which would apply to, to the prosecution service as well. Our, our budget on one view is, is a much simpler affair than that of the, the, the court service. Our um, primary cost is our staff and beyond that it's, for us it's about our, our buildings that we operate from our, our, uh, um, and the cost of forensic pathology and so on one view our, our, our budget is a much simpler one but um, I, think there is, I, I think I would particularly emphasise the point that Malcolm's just made about looking beyond the advantages of just a single organisation's budget but looking at the justice system as a whole I think that would be particularly important the ability of all parts of the justice system to be able to plan together on a slightly longer term basis with a slightly increased degree of certainty um, and clarity, I think, would be would be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. OK, thank you for that. OK, I'm going to open up questions and I'm going to bring in Liam Kerr and then Ben McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. And I remind the committee and the panel that I am a practising solicitor and I appear in the employment tribunals every so often. Uh, Malcolm Graham, uh, in October... The SCTS published the latest modelling for criminal business in the High Court and Sheriff Courts that you've referred to earlier on. There is a suggestion in there that an additional trial court might be required in the High Court to achieve recovery by 2026. Are resources available for that? And if not, how much are needed in this budget? Thank you and good morning. Um, the resources are not available for that additional court at the moment to answer that question directly. Um, and alongside the answer to the question about multi-year planning, one of the other great uncertainties that we have as a demand-led system is what is the demand on the system going to be for next year? The modelling um, is an attempt to start to shape up what the demand will look like coming into the future so that we as an organisation, but most importantly, with other partners in the justice system can start to plan for the capacity that inevitably has a lead time to build in. We can't stand up uh, additional high courts with the requirement for all the extra staff, the judiciary, the space, which quite frankly at the moment we wouldn't have without some degree of notice. Mm -hmm. The reason that that is in the modelling is really an indication to say that if we don't do something different with the level of demand that's coming into the high court, then we're likely to see the direction of travel in terms of uh, the number of cases that are waiting to go to trial and the overall journey time of those cases, which is a very important measure in terms of the impact it has on victims and witnesses. We're likely to see those go in the opposite direction than we've been seeing in recent years with the recovery programme. And, and I think fundamentally what I would say to that is that this brings us to the point where uh, the notion of recovering from the pandemic, which was absolutely the right thing to do when uh, the case backloads went through the roof for reasons that are well understood, and the fantastic response from the justice system and SCTS at the core to that, to, to recover from it, that, that, that moment is passing. And what we're now dealing with is a new level of sustained demand, which is indicating the modelling, I think is likely to increase in the future and that's not got anything to do with COVID. That's to do with the fact that there are more cases being indicted into the High Court and Sheriff in Solemn. It is likely with some changes in the law and what I see from uh, other data around about recorded crime and crime that's been reported into the Crown, that that is going to continue for the foreseeable future. And at the moment, um, alongside some of the concerns that there will be about the, uh, the time bar changes, which will come into effect next November. Um, you know, we don't have uh, the capacity within that part of the system to deal with that additional demand that's coming down the road. Uh, I'm very grateful. I'm going to come on to the time bar in two seconds. Just, it, it, there was a second part of my question, which was just, when we look at the budget, when this committee sees the budget that comes out, are you able to give us an idea of how much will be required in terms of that uh, high court, the extra... Uh, trial court? Well, at the moment, my proposal is that we stick with the number of high courts that we've got, which is 22, not the 23 that's in the modelling, and that what, we, what, what, what we're doing at the moment is exploring, jointly with the Crown and with uh, the people who administer and run the high courts, how we can use the existing capacity that we have to try to manage the cases in a different way, which is going to allow us to, uh, to absorb that existing demand. <laughs> The reason I flag that up specifically is that it's important to say 
it's not unlikely that that demand will increase. I, I go back to some changes in the law, uh, an ACC from Police Scotland who heralded, I think, based on some unpublished data, that the first six months of this year has seen a 20% increase in the number of rapes uh, recorded by Police Scotland compared with the uh, first six months of last year. I haven't seen the data on that, but it was it was heavily covered um, within the media. These are all indications that, that these things are likely to rise, and I'm trying to draw on the different data sources that I can to get ahead of uh, what that will look like before it arrives at the court um, because of that lag time that's required. At the moment, the plan is to stick with 22 high courts um, because it's not just the capacity of the court that's important. It would also have to be done in consulta consultation with the capacity of the Crown, uh, the capacity of the Faculty of Advocates uh, and, the, and the other parts of the system, judicial capacity, etc., before we move to a position of changing the number of the courts. So that might be some way down the road. I'm very grateful. John Logue, uh, moving to your submission, you heard Malcolm Graham there talking about the COVID time bar legislation. You've specifically uh, mentioned that in your submission. You've said the Scottish Parliament has approved an extension of the date for removal of the pandemic extended time bar legislation to November 2025. And you then go on to say... The model chosen by Parliament to end the extended time bars represents a very significant challenge for the criminal justice system with a high risk of disruption to the operation of the courts and increases in the prison remand population. For the benefit of the committee, are you able to explain precisely what you mean by significant challenge, high risk of dis disruption? And given that, as you've pointed out elsewhere, the time bar is not going to be extended further, uh, what do you need to see in the budget to ensure that the backlog and the disruption is not felt in November 25? Yes, thank you. Um, I think my starting point sh should be to clarify that uh, I and uh, none of my colleagues in the prosecution service are in favour of uh, extending the emergency time bars um, on a permanent basis. We wish to return to the traditional time bars um, that existed before the pandemic. The question is how you do that, and the model that Parliament has chosen involves a single date at which, for every single case which is currently live and being prepared for the court, um, that will just stop. My preference would have been to see a, a staged approach to that, whereby on a particular date, for example, Parliament could have chosen to uh, bring the time bar to an end for new cases after that date, and therefore you would have been able to continue working, the system would have been able to continue working on the basis that cases already being prepared, um, were being prepared according to one time bar and new cases being uh, prepared according to the traditional time bars. Now that introduces a degree of complexity, but it avoids what, what we are now facing, which is a sudden date where everything is affected by a change in the time bar. Now that presents a significant risk at the moment of our caseload um, we have about approximately 2,000 cases being prepared for court, which we expect to indict, um, which at the moment are beyond the traditional time bar. Um, now, we will do our very best with the resource that we have next year to make progress in bringing that number down as close as possible to zero. But if we are not able to make the progress we would like, um, then the cases that are beyond the traditional time bar suddenly risk being time barred and therefore there are actions that we would require to take by way of either applying to the court to extend the time bar um, or um, in an individual case-by-case -case basis or by seeking to bring those cases into court as quickly as possible. Now, both of those options present risks. Both are directly... Those, that risk is, is uh, quant quantified largely by the resource that we have available to do the work over the next year. Um, but there is no doubt that uh, that, I think, is uh, a significant challenge, the likes of which I've not seen in my career in the prosecution service. I'm very grateful. And I think people will understand that your staff um, and the whole system will be doing its absolute best, given that hard stop in November 2025. I wonder, for the benefit of those uh, following this session, if you can make this clear for them uh, what the implications are, so such that if the backlog is not addressed in time and the time bar reverts in November 2025, I've certainly had it expressed to me that in some, some of the most serious cases, 
because I understand solemn cases will be particularly impacted. Is it possible then that some people, some accused, would not be held uh, or indeed tried? Is there a risk that some individuals accused of the most serious crimes that we heard about earlier, murder, rape, could walk free? So the, the, the law is that if, if time bars are not met by a particular, if the process has not reached a particular stage by a particular point by reference to the first appearance in court, then there is a risk either of accused being uh, released from custody or the case not being prosecuted. Now, we, we, we will do everything we can to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Um, but the consequence, for example, of having to bring many applications before the court to retrospectively extend time bars or to do it in advance um, risks interfering with the normal flow of the court business, which we currently see. So the, even taking some of the preventative steps that we, we may plan for on a contingency basis um, risks slowing down the general operation of the court system. And that, therefore, has an effect which I don't think um, is, is commonly or widely understood, which is that you risk then slowing down the progress of, of cases before the court. Um, I think there's a, 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 a narrow view of the time bars that the sooner you move to the traditional time bars, the better, because you then expect the system to work on a much shorter period of time. But actually, when you look at the consequences of doing that in the way that Parliament has decided, you actually risk creating the very consequences that you're you're trying to guard against because you will slow down the court process. Um, that may well have an impact on the prison population. Um, there are a number of adverse consequences that, that may happen if, if this situation um, cannot be um, dealt with in a way that um, allows the cases to be indicted, avoids the risks that you're talking about, but also avoids the wider risks to the operation of the, the justice system as a whole. That's clear and very grateful. OK, thank you. Ben McPherson and then Sharon Dowdy. Good morning both and thank you for your evidence so far and your submissions. In the written submission from uh, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service, uh, it states that the organisation, uh, and I quote, is committed to reducing resource needs as pandemic recovery progresses and reflecting efficiencies in casework reform and system level transformation. Do both of your organisations uh, see scope for future savings if there's investment in the in the coming budget in the coming years and um, multi-year budget settlements as has already been discussed that would uh, provide scope for future savings and if so uh, when might these future savings be realized I don't know if mr log if you want to take that first crown agent certainly um i think the the clearest example i think i can give of um what you're describing is the um, summary case management reforms, which um, I first mentioned to this committee, I think, two years ago at a point where they were just being introduced. And we now have the benefit, uh, two years on, of a full evaluation, which was published uh, in September, um, which confirms, I think, everything that we had hoped for when I first described it two years ago. Um, and th that evaluation has confirmed that there is a different way of operating the summary courts, a, a different way of, of working, all parts of the system, working together and um, achieving outcomes at a much earlier stage, which is better for everyone, um, and cutting down on the work which is needed to maintain the system which, in the way that it operates at the moment. Um, so the evaluation report um, which I'm sure the committee's seen, confirms a number of points which, which describe that benefit. Fewer witness citations um, for all witnesses, including the police. Uh, cases coming to a conclusion much more quickly. Um, I can describe it in very general terms to illustrate the scale of what we think could be achieved um, it, once this is rolled out across the country. So before the summary case management, reforms were introduced in Dundee, Paisley and Hamilton. Um, the figure which I traditionally quoted was that it takes, I, I need about 120 to 125 prosecutors every day to go to all of the summary courts in Scotland at all stages, not just for trials. Um, in order to have 120 to 125 prosecutors, I need more than that because I need to be able to cover things like leave and sickness absence and training. So at the moment, 
that is the, the resource requirement of all the summary courts. If you... Together with support staff. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just talking about the prosecutors who have to go to court, yeah. but you've got many, many more case staff working in the offices, preparing those cases, dealing with them once they're finished in court. Um, if you can reduce and achieve the benefits that we're beginning to see in places like Dundee in particular, or even go beyond what Dundee has achieved and do it consistently across the country, um, I wouldn't need to send 125 prosecutors to court every day. I might only need to send um, two-thirds, a half, um, you know, very significant reductions if you look at the indications. Um, mm -hmm. It's difficult to be precise about that. I can't really put a figure on what that figure would look like, but we know from what the evaluation report says about Dundee that it wasn't just a marginal gain. It was very, very significant. Um, so, for example, the number of police witness citations in Dundee dropped by two-thirds on the last data that I saw. In Paisley and Hamilton, it was very close to being down by half. Um, so these aren't marginal improvements. These are very, very significant changes that demonstrate the real benefits that can be achieved. And you can imagine what that would be like for um, victims, witnesses, and for the accused. The case is dealt with much more quickly. Um, in some cases, within a matter of weeks, rather than taking many, many months. If you put all that together, that's you can begin to see a summary court system which is much smaller than the one that we have at the moment. Now, I think your question about when, I think realistically we have, um, I think, two very challenging years ahead of us to continue dealing with the pandemic. Um, I think there are still many consequences of the pandemic in terms of caseload, either before the court or about to come before the court. Um, and I think the reform um, of the summary courts realistically is going to take another year to two years. I would like to see it happen as quickly as so possible. So mid-26? Mid so I, I think realistically you're looking at a period for the prosecution service of between 2027 and 2030 where you could begin to see the benefits of reform and also the benefits of moving beyond the consequences so of the pandemic. So for the rest of this parliament, the focus could and should be perhaps on supporting the reform so that um, in the next parliamentary term, starting to see the benefit of... I would like to see across the whole justice system support, I think, for the two things I mentioned at the beginning. Reform, which we're demonstrating is working, and I think there are things we can learn from that that we can apply elsewhere in the criminal justice system as well. Mm. I, I, I think we can work with the rest of the criminal justice system to improve the operation of the jury courts and the sheriff court and, and also the high court, but also... The second point is about the pandemic, the, 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 mm. the dealing with the consequences of the pandemic. I think we still have another couple of years of uh, working through the consequences of the pandemic. So support for the justice system as a whole in all aspects on those two broad areas, I think, would position the justice system from 2027 onwards to look quite different from the way that it does at the moment. And you, you, quite rightly, you've emphasised the, the reality of the backlog of the, the pandemic implications, and, and thanks for emphasising that. Just before... Um, Mr Graham comes in, and um, if you both want to, to touch on this, so just lastly, uh, Corinne, um, yesterday PCS Union published a report which uh, highlighted a number of, of issues, including um, IT infrastructure and the challenges uh, of physical infrastructure, such as the IT digital systems in productivity. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on how much you see capital investment and improvement of that infrastructure being important in terms of efficiency, uh, progressive justice, and also uh, morale and uh, the knock-on effect that that has on your revenue budget and, and some of the, the demands that you mentioned. Uh, so I'm, I'm aware of the PCS report. I've not had a chance yet to discuss it with my colleagues who are members of this, the PCS and, and, and represent the PCS, but I've asked for such a meeting so that I can discuss the report with them and work out with them how we can um, involve their, their, their suggestions in the reform work that we're already undertaking. So um, the key point there is that we're already undertaking a process of reform within the prosecution service to try and address a number of issues and in broad terms, we've already identified from what staff have told us that some of the things they would like to see work better in the future would be, for example, better better IT, better case management systems, 
um, and also more investment in uh, learning and training. And so those are two priorities for us as an organisation which we've already identified. And my plan would be to have a discussion with the PCS about how we can take what is in their report and, and take account of it in the work that we're already doing. You're linking those points to the budget and you're absolutely right to do so. There is no doubt our ability to invest more in learning and training, our ability to invest capital in new IT systems which can themselves help with um, automating work, becoming more efficient and, and helping us to change the way we do our work and improve it are all directly linked to the budget that we get. So that our ability to um, to reform, as I described at the beginning, is directly linked to, to, to the budget in the coming two to three years. Thank you. Mr Graham, do you want to add anything on to it? There are now a number of questions in there. I will attempt to uh, address all of them. Uh, I won't repeat what John has already said, um, but I would wish to emphasise the criticality uh, and importance of the summary case management approach uh, and the dependence we will have on that for efficiencies and its future rollout over the course of the, the next calendar year. Um, your first question around about future savings is absolutely at the heart uh, of my whole approach to um, SCTS and a commitment to collaborative work across the, 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 the justice system, um, really on two fronts. Uh, the, the, the change that we're seeking to bring in uh, either introduces efficiencies or it introduces service improvements to, um, for instance, victim-centred approaches, uh, to our ability to uh, introduce new and different services, trauma-informed approaches, etc. Ideally, these reforms would bring in both, um, but that isn't always the case. Some of the reforms we're bringing in that are service improvements, particularly initially, have an additional <coughs> cost attached to them. For instance, uh, evidence by commission, uh, which is trauma-focused, it's victim-centred, it allows uh, victims in certain cases to give evidence uh, at an early stage uh, in their case, which reduces the trauma and in a way where they don't have to appear at trial, uh, but it does add cost into the system as, as well. It's, it's a reform measure uh, uh, facilitated through legislation um, which won't bring in efficiency with it. But we are focused on productivity and efficiency. And it's right to focus on uh, summary case management because by case volume, and, and this isn't um, the only indicator that you would use, but by case volume, uh, share of summary business accounts for 65%, roughly 65% of what goes through the courts. So if that element of criminal business is made more efficient, whilst it might free up substantial efficiencies, it won't necessarily all be realisable as savings. Because to go back to Mr Kerr's comments earlier, part of what we would plan to do is to reinvest that capacity into areas where demand is growing, uh, in the High Court and in uh, Sheriff and Solemn Procedure. So the exact sort of path of where we can create su sufficient efficiencies at scale through all of the reforms which are laid out in the written submission, which I won't seek to address uh, as a list by way of saving time as it's already there, will allow us to have a choice as individual organisations and as a system where that capacity is put. Now, we only have that choice if the investment comes in a sustained way that allows us to, to make the transformation, much of it process-driven, but a lot of that supported by digitisation, as you've already hinted at. Uh, and, and, and if we have that choice, then it gives us a greater level of certainty over being able to answer that question alongside the variabilities of demands. So if all the demands were to remain constant as they are, which I've already said I don't think that they will in relation to particularly more serious crime coming into the court system, if they were to remain constant, I would be able to give you a more certain answer that says we would make savings and we would be able to uh, you know, deliver a clearer timeline on what a smaller court system might look like. But as those demands are likely to increase, the criticality of the investment into uh, the reform that we want to continue with and the new reform that we want to start is even greater for creating capacity that we can move into other parts of the system where the demand is, is increasing. Now, the investment that we've had to date has not always allowed us to move 
at the pace that we would like around about digitisation. And that's why I think the submission uh, that is in front of you is a realistic assessment uh, of what looks like a substantive amount of, of budget to put into digital transformation, to continue the digital transformation that we're doing, but also to move into new digital transformations that are going to have the effect that, uh, that I've already carried. A, a final point in relation to your first set of questions is round about the risk of reduced budgets across the system. That has a vicious cycle impact, in my experience. If budgets are reduced, single organisations retrench to mm -hmm. core duties. The ability for us to collaborate as a system diminishes. I have experience of that through the course of my career, and I have no reason to think that it would be different now. Whereas, alternatively, there is light at the end of the tunnel. If the sustained funding that is being sought is given, then there is every prospect to believe, based on you know, business cases that have been carefully developed and evidence submitted, that there will be efficiencies that will allow us to create capacity, not only for some savings, but also to divert it into <coughs> the other areas where demands are growing or where we want to improve services to make services better, where it might cost more money. But that's the right thing to do, because strategically it's the, the direction that we've agreed. And then very finally, on the, the, the PCS report, uh, I, I have had a glance at the report, but only came in very, very recently. And, and it strikes me uh, that what I've seen, uh, if, if the headlines of that report are um, that there isn't a sufficient level of funding in the system, that our people are absolutely critical to delivering what we do, and that we need digital transformation to enable it faster, uh, then I can agree with all of that, uh, and I plan to work very closely with PCS in my role to make sure that uh, we're doing these things together. Thank you both. Thank okay, you, Kimberly. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got about half an hour left, and we've still got four uh, members looking to come in. So I would politely ask just for fairly succinct responses and questions. And on that, I'll bring in Sharon, and followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm going to continue in the same line of questioning as my colleague, Ben McPherson, and you may already have answered some of the questions, but given that uh, it was just described as the criticality and importance of the summary case management pilot, then I'll ask it again, and if you can give me any extra information. So the recent evaluation noted that it led to an increase in the early resolution of cases along with a range of associated benefits. So if you could tell me a wee bit more about what you see as the main benefits of the approach taken in the pilot, um, not only for your organisation, but also for others. If I could ask John Loeb that. Thank you. I'm very happy to uh, perhaps give a little bit more detail. Um, one other figure which illustrates, I think, the scale of what can be achieved and is, a, is an indication of... of um, how things could look quite different is about a year ago in Dundee Sheriff Court, in the Summary Court, my understanding is there were approximately 1,100 summary cases. Um, a year on, um, that number is um, about 250. So the, the Summary Court, if you can imagine a, a busy Sheriff Court with far fewer cases in it, um, it's much easier to programme those cases and bring them to a conclusion at an earlier stage. It's much easier for the judge in the case, the sheriff, to make inquiries of both the prosecutor and the defence at the beginning, work out what the issues are, and, and manage that process from, from the position of, of the judge, um, rather than the traditional model of cases start and are then just assigned a date in the future, and, and the, the, you know, there's work then done to make sure they're, they're prepared. So that's an extra bit of information that tries to illustrate the, 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 the scale of the benefit that we have seen in Dundee um, in the last year. What that means in terms of benefits for my organisation and, and across the system and for the public is that you're not preparing and repeat preparing cases. And that, I think, is one of the critical elements that impacts on the organisation, but most importantly on the public. There is an increasing certainty, I would say, in Dundee and Hamilton and Paisley and the other courts which have now started to adapt, adapt the model, that if you are told the trial is going to be on a particular date, there is an increasing certainty that that trial will take place on that date. That's better for all of the witnesses in the case. It's, it's, it's better for the accused that the case is resolved as quickly as possible. And a particular benefit, I think, for the victim in, in having that 
that greater certainty. So I think that's a very significant part of the public benefit. Um, that translates into, in terms of the prosecution service, um, uh, fewer, uh, less work, because you are not repeat preparing a number of cases. You are able to get more cases through to a conclusion and do it um, as planned on the first uh, occasion that a case has been set down. So I think there, you can imagine there are a number of particular ways in which that, that, that benefits the organisation, but they all flow from that, that single fact that less, fewer cases are, are going to trial and those that do um, are more likely to go ahead at the first, on the first trial diet. Thanks. Um, so on that you mentioned that it's starting to get rolled out in other places as well. Could you maybe tell us more about the plans for rolling out the pilot in courts across the country? <laughs> and is it likely that it will ultimately lead to resource savings? So the, um, the pilot is led by the judiciary. It's led by um, sheriff's principal who... Um, for each of their respective sheriffdoms, uh, are, have certain statutory responsibilities for the way that the courts operate. So they lead this particular project, um, the court service, the prosecution service and the police and uh, others, including the Legal Aid Board and defence lawyers, have been involved. So it's, it's, a, it's a joint project involving lots, all of the, 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 the parts of the, the criminal justice system. The rollout, therefore, will be determined by the... Uh, the project team that is led by the judiciary, and that is still formally to happen. But I think it is clear from the evaluation that there is a strong wish on every part of the system to see this rolled out um, to all of the summary courts in Scotland. So the timetable time for that is still to be established. But at the moment, it's operating in the original courts of Dundee, Paisley and Hamilton. It's also operating in Glasgow for domestic abuse cases, and it's also operating in Perth. Um, and personally, I would like to see it um, in all sheriff courts for all summary cases as, as soon as possible. Your question about resource savings, um, I would agree with, with um, what Malcolm said a moment ago. I think it will be a combination of resource savings, but also allowing the criminal justice system to redirect resource to other work that is, is important. So, for example, in relation to the prosecution service, if I no longer need to send 125 prosecutors to the summary courts every day, um, that gives me capacity to look either at resource savings, but also redirecting that resource to um, communication with victims or preparing jury cases or investigating deaths. There are a number of areas that are of real importance for us in changing the way that people experience the service that we provide that I would like to be able to redirect resource to. And at the moment, I can't do that because the largest part of the criminal justice system by volume demands a certain amount of resource just because of the number of courts that are sitting every day. So I think it would be a combination of increasing the capacity to make savings and allowing the parts of the criminal justice system to redirect the resource. The other benefit I should have mentioned in relation to the prosecution services, um, we have been able to implement a new model of contacting victims in domestic abuse cases. Uh, one of the prosecutors, over and above the normal victim information service that we provide, one of the prosecutors in the team contacting the victim in each of the domestic abuse cases in each of the pilot courts. And that's something that we have found uh, victims have benefited from. And we think as prosecutors, it's actually benefited the preparation of our cases, <laughs> that giving us the time to do that helps with the, the preparation of the case before it comes to trial. So that's, that's another important benefit for the, the prosecution service and the pilot. The evaluation of the submission that you've sent in, it does actually sound really good. So, but it also says that it's been achieved to date without additional funding on the need for legislation, which is also good. So we can do reform without having to do legislation. And there obviously hasn't been a cost there. But when you've been doing it, has there been anything else that you're saying about reallocating resource? Is there anything that's been highlighted that you would need to go and add extra resource to? Um, and one of the things that I was thinking about was victim notification and also what Ben McPherson touched on was the IT systems because we heard from some of my other colleagues last night, we heard from PCAS on the report and they did say that the systems were antiquated 
um, they weren't fit for purpose. And one of the issues was trying to contact people for citations as well, for them going to court. So is there any, un well, any unintended consequences, I suppose, maybe from doing this pilot where you, you already know where the extra resources are going to have to be allocated? I, I do know, I think Malcolm wants to come in as well, so I'll mm -hmm. try and keep my answer brief. But I think, um, I think what we're going to have to look at carefully is that in any large-scale reform, um, we have been able to, up until now, in the pilot courts, deal with the consequences of doing work at an earlier stage in the case. And when you're also operating... Um, in a court which is, is operating the traditional model, that essentially is extra work that is having to be done because you're on top of operating the existing model, you're having to, in new cases, do work at the beginning of the case that might happen otherwise at a later stage. Um, that's been manageable up until now on a pilot basis in the courts. Um, there is a real question, I think, for all parts of the system, but particularly, I think, for the police and prosecution who bear the greatest burden of... of providing, for example, evidence to the accused solicitor at the beginning, mm -hmm. that's a real challenge. And so I think one of the things we do have to look at in the wider rollout is, um, would it be possible for additional funding on a non-recurring basis to help with that so that um, we can as quickly as possible get to the point where we then operate a system which is smaller, a better service and, and more efficient? And if I could just pick up the point about the IT systems mm -hmm. um, just very quickly... I think for the committee to have a fair and accurate view, I think the comments about antiquated systems, um, I would accept that some of our case management systems are older than I would like them to be. They do, um, they do, they do the basics. Sometimes it can feel that it's difficult to operate them. But we also have other case management, system, case management systems, digital tools, which are much more modern. Um, so, for example, all prosecutors in every sheriff court today, um, unlike when I started as a prosecutor, are taking all of their cases into court using an iPad. Um, and that involves a digital app that we developed ourselves um, over the last five to seven years. Um, so it's not... I wouldn't want you to think that describing the case management systems that are antiquated as antiquated means that all of them are at the not. There's a mix, and what I would like to do is make sure that we can um, modernise and update the ones that need updated and continue to develop new tools in the way that we have, for example, with prosecutors being able to take iPads into court. When I started in court, I would take a crate of files. That's no longer the case. They take their iPad with them. Um, so and as far as I'm aware, we're the only prosecution service in the world that operates a model like that. So, so is there enough money in the budget just now... Um, for you to do enough upgrades to your IT system to allow, for instance, the rollout of body worn video with the police service, because we heard last night that could be an issue as well. So, and obviously we're all very keen for that to roll out as quickly as possible. So, is there enough money in your current budget that you that would allow you the IT updates to allow the police to roll out body worn video? Uh, body worn video is part of our current planning and part of our budget assumptions for next year. Um, the longer term work that we're talking about, about updating and modernising all of our case systems, um, is uh, over a, is going to have to be work over a number of years. And that takes us back to the point that we made earlier about annual budgeting as opposed to multi year budgeting. And we are starting that process of doing that work, but it's going to take many, many years and, and a number of years of capital <coughs> funding to do that. And that's an issue that we're, we've raised with the government and discussing with them. Thanks. Sorry, Malcolm Green, have you got anything you want to add? Yeah, I'm very conscious of time uh, and I would support all that John has said. In relation to summary case management, firstly, um, it is important to recognise what's different about those pilots. I, I believe there, are, there will be an ambition uh, to roll that out during the course of next calendar year. I think it is right to consider rolling it out in combination with some of the other digital changes that are coming in the system, not because it's absolutely necessary for summary case management. That's already been proven through some of the pilots, but because it will accelerate the advantages and benefits that come from it. John's already highlighted that it's critical that this has been judicially led and it now has the support of the most senior judiciary in the country. That's critical for understanding the way in which change across the court system happens. It is digitally enabled in many places. Uh, the digitally enabled uh, evidence sharing 
but also we've put in a really substantive effort with some of the expenditure uh, on uh, digital from SETS to substantially enhance connectivity across courtrooms in the country, uh, wireless networks that are open to everybody that's working in the justice system, which makes a massive difference, actually a fundamental requirement when you're talking about sharing evidence digitally that people can access that in a way online in the place that they are working. And as John has said, at the heart of summary case management is early disclosure with a view to agreement of evidence. Uh, and now we have different ways of presenting and sharing that evidence, of which there's much more opportunity to come. Uh, the final thing that I think is different about summary case management has been the uh, importance of partnership and some equivalence in terms of the relationships across different people uh, that have got a key role to play. Now, clearly, uh, the judiciary and the court service are at the heart of that, with the Crown and the police responsible for uh, making the effort for that early disclosure of evidence. Uh, but we must be very careful not to forget the criticality of the defence in any criminal case. And engagement with the defence through this programme, I think, has been exemplary and is certainly something that I plan to build on with the relationship that I have with, for instance, the um, Criminal Committee of the Law Society of Scotland and how I want to take forward other changes. Now, the defence uh, bar associations <coughs> in Scotland uh, have their own issues that they've raised publicly about the system. But what I do know is critical is that if we don't work with everybody that plays a key part in what is a public service, then we won't be able to achieve these changes because one individual uh, organisation or agency uh, could, could effectively hold us back from being able to do that. And I think summary case management is an excellent example uh, where through that judicial leadership uh, and partnership um, tone and feel um, that, that there's been a very different outcome. It prevents that unnecessary churn, which ultimately will lead to a reduced court programme, um, which means that there'll be more trials where evidence is led, and that's better for victims, um, but it's better outcomes for justice as well. And on the digitisation points, yes, it's absolutely required. The refresh rate of systems continues to increase. I've pointed out in the submission that increasingly we're going to need additional sustained revenue budget to pay for IT as a service rather than to invest in a system. But the legacy estate that we're left with was at a point in time when there was large capital investments in monolithic systems that were then difficult to change. In SCTS, we've all... We'll probably have to come in because we've still got three... Uh, three members looking to come in and uh, probably a couple of supplementaries. So I, I wonder if I can maybe just stop you there and I'll bring in um, Fulton McGregor and then Rona Mackay. Fulton. Uh, thanks, Convener, and uh, good morning uh, to, to both the panel. Um, there will probably be an opportunity in one of my questions, uh, Malcolm, for you to um, reflect on, on some of that work that you were talking about there. The issue that I mainly wanted to go on was an issue that came up when we had Police Scotland in front of us last week. Uh, and actually, it's been an issue that this committee has grappled with um, on, on various occasions. And it's, uh, it's, the, it's this bit about um, police officers and the amount of time they're spending at court. And we heard some quite shocking figures from Police Scotland last week about just how much time has been spent at court, including when officers are actually off on annual leave or rest days. Um, and we also hear that in about 90% of cases, officers are not actually often called forward. And I think we all recognise that as well from our own uh, work as MSPs and uh, perhaps in, in, in previous roles before uh, coming into Parliament. So I'm wondering what what steps has uh, is the Crown and Prosecution Service taken to address this issue? We did hear last week that there has been good engagement between the police uh, and the Crown, uh, uh, and, and that work is ongoing, but is there anything that can be done to accelerate this to avoid police officers having to be at court unnecessarily, because there could be huge savings there for the police service? Thank you. Um, I, so I, I recognise the issue that the police were describing to the committee. Um, it's, it's a priority. Um, for us and our working relationship with the police, the answer to it, uh, the answer to any of the issues in the criminal justice system is never a simple one and never one thing that, uh, that uh, needs just to be fixed in order for the problem to disappear. Um, what the police 
understandably are concerned about also impacts on members of the public who are called to give evidence and when cases don't go ahead and called to give evidence more than once. Um, and the causes of that um, are, there are multiple causes of that, some of which um, rest with the preparation of the case and, and in some cases the prosecution needs material from other organisations in, including the police and if all of that material isn't available then the case can't go ahead. So there are multiple reasons for that. But the very short answer to your question is that we are working with them. The police have done a great job, I think, in supporting summary case management. The, the, the change in police practice, I think, is really significant in terms of being able to support the early disclosure of evidence at the beginning. But that is paying dividends to policing, so reducing the number of police witness citations in Dundee by, um, I think I said two-thirds earlier, um, is the primary way in which we impact on the issue that you're describing. And I think the police understand that, and that's one of the reasons why they're very keen to see um, summary case management work. So I think that is the primary way in which we address this, this long-standing issue, um, um, which is down to the way in which the, the summary system currently operates. Um, it, it drives um, a lot of activity which isn't always um, uh, productive in, 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 at the point that it should be. And so I think if we can implement summary case management in the timescales that Malcolm's describing, I think we'll see a very different impact, uh, a very different picture for police officers who are required to come to court and give evidence. Yeah, that, I mean, I mean that would be good in any progress that we can make in this area. I think would be welcomed uh, by by this committee and and by others. Um, Malcolm, I'll give you a, a, a chance to um, come back in on some of the stuff you're talking about there, because I know you've already uh, began to reflect on it both both Malcolm and John in previous answers. But I wonder um, if there's other areas of the criminal justice system that you feel there could be more efficiency in. You'd started to talk there about some of the IT systems and stuff like that. Are you able to give maybe some practical examples of, of how how they might create efficiencies, perhaps, say, with social work or health services or, or whatever the case might be? No, th thank you. Um, just go back to your previous question. I very briefly mentioned the... Uh, certainly identify with the issue, as, as, as John said, uh, and, and are heavily engaged in conversations and a variety of different uh, steps which will make a difference in relation to police witnesses. One which I would hope to accelerate during the course of next year, which is included within the pitch for budget that we're making, is around about the remote provision of witness evidence, which at the moment we've made available to expert and police witnesses, but only in the higher courts. Um, but the take-up on that during the course of this year has been really, really encouraging. It got off to a bit of a, uh, a slower start uh, between some teething issues on the technology and per perhaps some issues on the police side, um, but that's really being used to good effect. It's not the whole answer, but I think it's a really positive step whereby police officers don't need to come to court and therefore they can be available um, in the place that they're working. I, I do appreciate that. that means they're not necessarily fully deployable, but I think it's part of the answer. In relation to um, other parts of the, the, the justice system, um, SCTS has been going through a programme of uh, you know, case management refresh where we started with moving to civil online, the ambition on the civil side, which I appreciate isn't uh, within the purview of this committee, but it is within uh, the pitch for budget that we make around about um, uh, an end-to-end -end digital process for uh, civil justice, uh, which I do think we can achieve um, within a meaningful time scale. And I think there will be a lot of learning from that for what is a far more complex and larger scale part of the system, which is the criminal element. The other thing that we're doing in the Office of the Public Guardian, which again is within the budget bid, is introduce a wholly new case management system, which builds on all the principles um, that I've spoken about uh, so far. There will be a system which we can update itself. It won't be a bespoke um, sort of monolithic system that we will implement and then we will have to replace in its entirety at a later stage down down the route, and that will effectively be the methodology that we will use for the consideration of the case management system on the criminal side, which I've already had an early conversation with John and other partners about, that we need to design as a system that benefits the whole of the criminal justice system, not something that's designed by one organisation who happens to be the organisation that runs the courts. It needs to either have uh, at least a strong level of coherence and connectivity 
um, if not there being something more than that as we go through that process. And that's the next stage that we move to is case management in terms of uh, criminal cases if we get the uh, if we get the funding that we've asked for. The benefits that come from that uh, will align with everything around about summary case management that comes from the early disclosure of evidence, efficiencies in terms of processing, which is done wherever possible by machines rather than repeating human input, uh, and means that the, the value add of our staff is going to be the skills and experience they've got in running courts, in uh, dealing with vulnerable victims, in meeting and dealing appropriately with jurors who are a critical part of our system, and not inputting data uh, into systems that isn't able to share it with other organisations or has to be input in multiple different ways. Thanks. Thank you. I think, Liam Kerr, you've got a wee supplementary. Uh, I'm very grateful, just following on uh, very well from uh, Fulton McGregor's question. Malcolm Graham, uh, you talked earlier on about capacity planning and you've talked just there about collaboration throughout the system and especially the criticality of defence. Now, there's huge concern about legal aid levels uh, and evidence that the result is that criminal defence is struggling with those we saw last week, Amar Anwar and co, uh, exiting the legal aid uh, area. And, uh, of course, we know that people are perhaps less keen to enter the profession uh, due to the conditions and pay. Where does this end up if we take the holistic view of the system that you're putting forward and what needs to happen if we're not to end up in that place? I, I think what I would say is that um, a healthy system needs to be run in balance and that the balance within that system means, means that every component part needs to be able to coherently come together for the common purpose. If one part of that system is out of balance, then it will hold back the whole of the system. Now, I don't have uh, the evidence, and I'm not well placed to speak uh, on behalf of defence solicitors across the country. You've, you, you've already alluded to them making their own case in relation to their concerns. I would merely say um, that it's something that we will watch very closely, and uh, I will make that commitment to work with every part of the system to ensure that we're, we're aware of what those pressures are, uh, and I will do what is appropriate within, uh, within my roles and responsibilities to ensure that that's either flagged or where I'm responsible for addressing any concerns that I do that as well. I'm very grateful. John Logue, do you have any thoughts? Uh, so I have never practised as a defence lawyer, um, and therefore I'm not really best placed to comment on issues like legal aid or, or capacity, but I think the one thing I would observe from my own experience from defence lawyers that I know and from what has been said publicly is that at the moment the way in which particularly the summary courts operate require defence lawyers very often to be in multiple places at the same time and that is a challenge for them in operating their business. I can imagine what that's, what that's like. Um, there is no doubt alongside all of the other benefits we've talked about in relation to summary case management that having a smaller court system with greater certainty um, it removes a lot of that burden for them. And I think that's already been said. I think it's in the evaluation from one of the, the lawyers in Hamilton who took part in the project has been able to speak from his own experience and I think has said so publicly that um, he has found it easier to be able to manage his business by having fewer multiple commitments on the same day. So I think um, it's another example of, it's another issue on which I think summary case management, I think, will help. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, Runa Mackay, then Katie Clark. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Um, I have a quick question for John Logue first before I move to, to Malcolm Graham. It's just about a, a press story that's appeared today about 4,600 COVID deaths in care homes being uh, still under investigation by the Crown Office. Um, and I just wondered if you, I think it's called Operation Coper, and I'm just wondering if you can... Um, say how that's going and what the time scale for the, for the remaining cases would be? Um, so I have to say I'm not aware of any press story today. I think um, there may have been press reporting yesterday. I don't oh, know if it's the same. It just, I beg your pardon. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the first thing I sh I think what the press story was commenting was on the information that's in my letter. Right, yeah. Um, and um, the Clarification I think I should offer on your question is that these aren't 4,600 care home deaths. Okay. 
These are 4,600 deaths that are related in some way to the pandemic that Procurators Fiscal are investigating. Right. Um, and going back to the point I made at the very beginning of evidence of progress over the last year, when we established the new capability in the organisation to focus on COVID deaths, um, I think the committee is aware of this from previous evidence, we started with about 6,000, approximately 6,000 death cases to be investigated. So um, what that article is describing based on my letter is what we see as the remaining caseload of deaths to be investigated, mm -hmm. some of which are in relation to, to care yes, homes, but uh, not, not all, far, yeah, far from that. all of them. Yeah. And, and if it was of interest, I could try and break down the data yeah. in, in more detail after today. Yes, I think it was started in 2020, would that be right? So on that basis, it may take a few years for, for it to conclude. So the pandemic started in 2020, but um, the uh, establishment of our team, I can't, I, I, I would need to double check. I think the resource allowing us to establish a team of about 90 staff um, didn't take effect, I think, until 2000, uh, 2023. All oh, right. Thank you. Um, and so, an accurate reporting here. <laughs> um, and therefore, and that we were given funding by the government uh -huh. to do that because uh -huh. we explained that this was something that was essential and needed to be done. Uh -huh. um, that funding initially was for a two-year period to take us until March of 2025, uh -huh. with four, over 4,000 cases still to be investigated. Um, we are making progress, but my expectation is we won't be able to conclude all of that by March of next year. Uh -huh. And therefore, part of our budget discussions with the government is about the continuation of that continue. funding to allow that work to continue. Okay, it's difficult you. to put a, an end date on that with any no, certainty, uh -huh. but, but yeah. hopefully the figures I've given you this morning show that it is work where we are making it's progress. In progress. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, can I come to Malcolm Graham, please? I wanted to um, ask you about uh, virtual domestic abuse courts. And in your submission, um, you state that the piloting of a, of a virtual domestic abuse court requires agreement and funding. So my questions are, um, I'm a bit confused because I understood that there were already pilots of domestic abuse courts. Maybe that's physical domestic, or, so it's not, that's not virtual. And what sort of level of funding would you need to set up the virtual ones? No, thank you for the opportunity to clarify. So there are domestic abuse courts yeah. in, in some places around the country. Yeah. Uh, some of them have been running for a very long time, yeah. uh, I think in excess of 10 years mm -hmm. uh, in, yeah. in the west of Scotland, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, th this is a, a really exciting opportunity to bring together uh, the benefits that would come from summary case management, but to trial that in an entirely virtual way and we'd be proposing to do that in uh, Grampians, Highlands and Islands, where some of the benefits of doing that in a virtual way might be best felt sure. in terms of the, yeah. the rural and remote nature uh, and the travel involved for, for all individuals. Uh, and it would be the first time uh, that we would have an end-to-end -end trauma-informed, specifically designed court process. Mm -hmm. And doing it for domestic abuse cases mm -hmm. uh, is, is undoubtedly the right place to start. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of work on this and, and everything is ready to go, with the exception of some uh, temporary funding for the pilot, mm -hmm. uh, which we've uh, asked for from the government from the start of next year to ensure um, that there can be recognition of uh, additional work undertaken, particularly by defence solicitors, uh, and to some extent, the, uh, the ongoing debate, if I can put it that way, is about what the best way is to recognise that in the absence of there being evidence about what that additional work is. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, that's what the purpose of the pilot is, mm -hmm. to prove the concept. Uh, and uh, I remain in conversations with uh, government officials and the Cabinet Secretary about hoping to secure that okay. for the start of next year. Well, that's really, really encouraging. I think you... You'll know that the women's organisation, Scottish Women's Aid, are very much in favour of that. So that's a real step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thank you. And Katie Clark. I could just ask a quick mm -hmm. supplementary on the, the point that, that Rona's just made, and then I was going to ask a more general question about funding, if that's okay, Convener. Um, so my recollection is that there was a, a pilot, a virtual pilot in Aberdeen. Um, during the pandemic that involved many domestic abuse cases. But in reality, very few cases actually operated virtually because both parties had to agree to take part in the pilot. So is this new proposal different from what happened in that previous pilot, which we heard about? It is different, and there's been a number of different pilots looking 
both at virtual custody appearances, but also uh, in a smaller way in virtual trials. This is different in the way it's been conceived. The group which has uh, met to, uh, to design what the court process was lo would look like, going back to my earlier comments, has included everybody um, that would need to sign up to this. Um, from the defence, the Crown, the police, and most importantly, uh, a really key part from uh, Victim Support Scotland and some of the other victim and uh, support ad advocacy agencies as well. So it is different from some of those previous, but it builds on the learning that comes from them as well. And do both parties have to agree, does the accused have to agree, the defence agents in each case to take part in the virtual pilot? Well, that, that will remain to be seen. I don't okay. think I've quite nailed down the process of whether we'll be able to overcome that or okay. not. OK, I understand that was a problem before, so it would be helpful perhaps if you could keep us closely advised in relation to that. That's Come very much appreciated. You. And obviously the, the primary purpose of today's evidence session is in relation to budgets, and there's been quite a number of areas that, that we've asked questions about. And in the submissions, from what I take from the submissions, I think the Courts and Tribunal Service are suggesting an additional 20.8 million revenue for next year, and the Crown Office and Procurator's Fiscal Service, 16 million pounds. And we've heard you know, about a number of um, proposals and work that, that may involve substantial budget implications. So if I perhaps go through them and, and, and maybe ask, you know, if, if we can get some more information either today or indeed in writing afterwards. So in relation to the summary case management pilot, I mean, as we know, there have been attempts in the court to get better case management in cases for many, many decades. It sounds to me that perhaps what's different on this occasion is the very central role of the judges, the sheriff, in driving that and perhaps giving them more powers to be able to drive that. But the only way that can work, obviously, is if other parts of the system are resourced. Um, so in terms of what the financial implication is, it, even if it is on a one-off basis or over a small number of years, um, what work is being done in terms of what that might be? So, for example, to use the police evidence, to agree police evidence, you need the police to be able to play the, their part. The, the, the Procurator Fiscal Service has to be able to provide the evidence to the defence. There has to be a defence agent who's able to take instructions from the client, and they need to be able to agree well in advance of the case getting before the judge. That all has... Um, resource implications, as I know, um, you know very, very well, and often it's one part of that process that fails, which is why it's not possible to agree something in court. So, to what extent are you looking at that as a, a whole system, and, and what do you think the resource implications might be? And if you can't give that information today, which I fully understand, is that something you could write to us about, not just in terms of this year's budget, but in terms of what that cost might be? Um, we did, as you know, as, um, as uh, members of the committee, a number of us met with PCS who launched their report yesterday. And in relation to the Procurator Fiscal Service and Crown Office, what they said was that there'd been problems with the IT system there for many, many years, a plan had been made to develop a new case management system called Phoenix, which was abandoned in 2010 after millions of pounds were invested due to bust budget cuts following the general election in that year. And as a result, the Crown Office and Procreative Fiscal Service have continued to use the same IT systems deemed unfit for purpose back in 2010. And we heard a lot of detail about the problems that that causes in terms of system failures, the system going down for many hours or you know, a day um, at a time, the problems with the postal citation um, of witness statements, but many other problems, um, I, I, you know, not just relating to the Crown Office and Procreator Fiscal Service, but, you know, the problems that the different IT systems not being able to speak to each other or share information with each other causes. Um, so, again, this sounds like a mammoth challenge, um, not just one part of the system, but would you be able to provide us with an understanding of what actually needs to be done, not just this year, but in terms of what the, you know, the investment implications are on justice budgets, but also what the potential savings potentially might be? So that's something that the committee could perhaps look at um, over um, a period of time. So th those are two issues that it maybe you've already done work on or could perhaps, you know, um, look at and respond to us. I don't know if either of the witnesses could come back on that. 
I, I will mm. let you come in, but mm. I think just in the spirit of time, I think we have covered a, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the whole system approach which which both our witnesses have spoken at length about and i think there was reference earlier on to the pcs report um so i think given what you've covered um there would be some value in in a written uh, or written follow-up responses uh, on that uh, if, if that's okay just in the spirit of time as well if convener um, in, in relation to summary case management all the additional funding that is required and, and I think you provided a very good summary uh, of, of what I'd already said and, and the discussion will come in bids for other parts of uh, digitization which will support it as opposed to a bid for an increase in summary case management funding um, but I do agree with your point uh, which again I think I've already emphasized that a sustainable and well-balanced system is what is at the heart of being able to uh, ensure these improvements for the future. In relation to the wider budget, uh, yes, I have flagged up additional pressures, um, which are itemised to, as I said at the start, around £14 million, but also seeking an additional £6.4 million for new digital transformation, which, again, uh, I've covered in some detail how that might be spent. But importantly, I'm also seeking the baselining of what has been recurring £21 million of RRT funding into the budget, which at the moment, to go back to the multi-year planning uh, piece where we started, is not secured in the budget on an annual basis. It's deemed to be additional and temporary, and the pitch that I am making quite clearly is actually this needs to be a baseline part of our budget so we're a sustainable organisation going forward. And on your final point, uh, I'm very happy to come back with further detail in terms of investment in digital and the benefits and savings that might come from that over a prolonged period. OK, thank you. Final word to Mr Logue, if, if, if you wish. You don't have to. Uh, thank you, Convener. I might, if you, if you don't mind, I might just say a few words, um, and we will follow up in writing. But I'll, I'll keep this very brief. I think it is, in in general terms, very difficult to do what what Katie Clark is asking for, because of the period of time over which I think, if we are honest with ourselves, this work requires to be done. We are talking about. Um, I, I'm in person in conversations with staff. I'm being quite clear that I think. Um, modernising IT within our service is something that I think could easily take five to ten years. Now, the days of building one big new computer system and it fixes everything, if it ever existed, are long gone. What we do is, over a period of years, use our capital budget and invest either in new tools that we can turn on and switch off the old ones that people find frustrating, or we invest in the existing systems and, and update them and keep them going. And while I get the point that is made by this PCS that staff find some of our existing systems frustrating, and I do emphasise the point I made earlier that it is some of our systems, it's not all of them, and the key point there, I think I would illustrate, is the digital evidence sharing system that we haven't really talked about today. Mm -hmm. um, very simple to use and at a stroke cuts out all of the movement and copying and use of disks and pen drives and all of the risks that go. That goes overnight. Um, so there are things that are happening in some of our offices now that are benefiting PCS members. Um, so it is very much important, I think, to keep the question of IT difficulties in context and even the systems that our staff find frustrating actually have a very, very, very high uh, standard of availability and reliability. There are things about using them that are frustrating. Um, I find that. I, I understand and agree with the staff who find it frustrating. But I think it's important to put it in context. We are not an organisation that only has one system mm -hmm. that is many, many years old and is not fit for purpose. That's not. I don't think that's the picture the PCS was trying to create, and it's not. I wouldn't want the committee to have that picture. And I think the final um, point I would make is that uh, we will be able to share the information such as we have it on our immediate plans for the sort of modernisation that I'm talking about, but for the reasons I mentioned at the beginning, I think it would be very difficult to project any more than perhaps two or three years ahead or even further, which I think realistically is the sort of timescale we're talking about. Um, I suspect I will be uh, gone from the organisation before it achieves everything I would want to see in terms of um, the, the sort of digital tools that uh, committee members probably have in mind. Okay. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you very much indeed. I will have to bring the session uh, to a close. We've overrun a bit, but I think that's been of value. So thank you very much, uh, both of you, for uh, attending uh, this morning. And we'll have a short suspension just to allow for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, members. So our next panel of uh, witnesses are representatives of the Scottish Prison Service, and we're joined by uh, Theresa Medhurst, Chief Executive, Linda Pollock, Deputy Chief Executive, and Gerry O'Donnell, Director of Finance at the Scottish Prison Service. So uh, a warm welcome to you all, and I intend to allow around about 75 minutes for this session. I would ask for um, concise uh, questions uh, and responses. There's a lot that we're very interested in uh, and a lot to get through, so I would ask for um, brevity uh, in questions. So, um, just to point out to members that in addition to papers one and two uh, that you already have, um, I also want to refer uh, members to the written submission from HMIPS, uh, which was circulated separately uh, and which is relevant to our questioning uh, today. So I wonder if I can um, kick things off with a general opening uh, question um, for yourself, Theresa Medhurst. So um, what do you see as the main financial challenges facing the Scottish Prison Service? And what is the position of the Scottish Prison Service in terms of its advice to the Scottish Government on what budget resources needed for uh, prisons in 2025-26? Good morning, convener. Good morning, committee members. I um, really welcome the opportunity to speak to you this morning and answer your questions in relation to the budget. Um, if you could be patient um, with me, obviously I'm struggling with my voice, but my colleagues will step in and help out when I have difficulty. <clears throat> so on your, your first question, um, obviously from the submission you know that we are a complex um, but demand-led service, um, and the population today has again tipped over 8,300. We're sitting at 8,313 with 125 individuals on home detention, home detention curfew. So the operating and structure um, expenditure is often subject to fluctuations that are not within our control. A large proportion of our budget um, is exposed to inflation and obviously to public sector pay policy as well. Um, we are therefore limited as well in the tools we have available to address and to predict cost pressures from new and emerging challenges. <clears throat> the critical pressure um, that we are experiencing is obviously the rising prison population. And at the moment, the um, Scottish Government modelling figures are only available six months in advance, which makes it very difficult for us to plan and prepare um, for even a year in advance when we're working on six monthly um, population figures. Um, in addition, not just to the rising um, costs from population pressures, which related to um, payroll and prisoner-related costs. There are also um, the costs related to an increase in complexity. So we are seeing increased social care costs um, and increased costs associated with security in relation to things like drone activity, which has um, increased significantly this year. So. The pressures um, that we're experiencing just now um, arising from the population um, increase. That since the beginning of 2023, we've seen a rise of over 900 in our population, which really equates to an establishment the size of Berlin. Um, and that's clearly very significant. Um, we also have um, contract, uh, two private sector contracts, one with um, a private sector prison, HMP Adiwell, and the escorts contract. And again, the costs of those continue to be above normal inflation levels. Um, we have additional costs required for um, Kilmarnock coming into the public sector, HMP Kilmarnock coming into the public sector for the first time in March of the last financial year, um, but the cost increases um, associated there are an impact of the enhanced terms and conditions um, with the transfer of staff into the SPS. 
<clears throat> um, we remain committed to our corporate plan, our five-year corporate plan. Our strategic intent is still to provide safe, secure and rehabilitative regimes and environments in prison, um, and that it will be additional funding required there. Um, so we have been looking at our case management um, processes, um, and that will probably take around... We've got a four-year plan on that at the moment to make improvements there, and that will improve progression for long-term prisoners. Um, body-worn cameras um, for security for staff within the prison. So there are a number and range of factors which we want to continue to develop that are in line with our corporate plan. We do recognise that um, all of the pressures that we're experiencing this year, we started from um, a, a funding pressure of around £18 million, which has risen over this financial year due to the increased costs from Kilmarnock to just over £20 million in near cost pressures this year. And we have been working really closely with the Scottish Government um, during the course of the year, having discussions over those cost pressures for this year alone. If I come on to next year, um, so our forecasting, we've done some high-level forecasting, but we are continuing more detailed um, budget forecasting with across the organisation. Um, but we have submitted um, high-level figures to Scottish Government um, last month. So um, the figure that we consider that we require on our revenue budget, in addition to our current budget, would be a over £53.6 million, um, and our capital request for next year would be um, for £387 million, and the bulk of the funding there would obviously be for HMP Highland, which is already under contract, um, and for HMP Glasgow, which we are yet to sign a contract for. I think I'll stop there, can you? <laughs> give, your, give your voice a break. Um, th thank you for that it's a helpful sort of uh, opening, um, opening scene setting. I, I wonder if I can just pick up on the prison population, which is, is, is pretty much uppermost in, in all our minds, uh, and we recognise the, the significance of the challenges that that's placing uh, on the Scottish prison service. So, as at the 25th of October, um, the prison population was sitting at 8,226, expected to rise, as you say, with several prisons already over capacity. What are the implications um, for uh, the prison service um, arising from those increasing numbers, specifically in and around the budgetary sort of implications? Um, that we're looking at today. So I, I know from your submission it's practical things like the cost of food, social care, health care and so on. It'd just be interesting to hear a wee bit more detail in and around that. So I think what, what we are unable to cost is staff time um, because clearly <clears throat> when the population increases both in number and complexity. What you're talking about is far more people who, for example, are on talk, are talk to me process, um, far more people who could be um, subject to the management of prisoners who are at risk of substance um, substances. Um, all of those uh, processes required to be case managed. Um, case management takes time, it takes staff away from their daily duties in order to do that. In addition to that, when we are overcrowded, we struggle to move people across the estate. So, for example, we are we have around between 8 to 10 per cent of our population at any one time um, is involved in serious organised crime gangs. Below that, though, there are localised crime gangs in most of the major cities. And at one point, the Governor of Edinburgh um, indicated that there were 14 localised gangs that she were having to manage below the serious organised gang structure. Um, to keep people separate, to keep them safe, you have to apply Rule 95 far more frequently, which means people are being kept out of association when normally we'd, we would be able to move them to other locations. 
we're unable to do that because we don't have those spaces to separate people out. And again, all of that needs to be case managed. So what you do is you have to restrict and constrict your regime activity, so that's your purposeful activity, our ability to provide services and support to people um, in order to uh, uh, provide rehabilitative activity is constrained. And therefore, we are concentrating on keeping people safe um, and trying to ensure that our prisons are as safe as possible. So that, although there are costs associated with food, with clothing, etc., I think those kinds of costs are the unseen costs. And the, the other thing around that in terms of staff time is when they are focusing more on transactional work and on things like heightened case management, they are unable then to deal with, to, to manage relationships as well as they would normally do. Um, tensions rise then within prisons, they're not able to detect and identify information that will help our intelligence analysts, um, as well as understand when people are experiencing distress um, because they are being kept and continuously busy and focusing on immediate tasks as opposed to looking at the broader picture within our prison estate. So I take it then that makes it quite difficult to sort of almost put a figure on it. You spoke about unseen costs and, you know, a lot of what you've set out are um, impacts, if you like, or outcomes that I would imagine are quite difficult to sort of quantify in budgetary terms. But presumably from what you're saying, there is quite a significant budgetary uh, impact um, not just in terms of the sort of practical things that were spoken about, but as you see, some of the things that are not quite so obvious. Would that be fair to say? Yes. I mean, we have tried to, to put in some quantification, but again, as I say, it's been fairly high level mm -hmm. um, or around what additional resource um, is each establishment needs mm -hmm. in order to settle things a bit more. Yeah. But we're not then we're still not able to get on on the front foot so that 53.6 million does um include some additional staffing costs to ease some of those mm -hmm. pressures mm -hmm. okay. but i think the I, th I suppose the concern that i have is given that we cannot plan or predict where the population is going to increase mm -hmm. so for example when we um, undertook the emergency early release arrangements in june and july we anticipated at that point we would have a three-month window whereby we would be able to ease the pressure across the estate. That wasn't realised mm -hmm. and therefore that pressure has continued. Now, it has eased the pressure somewhat in that we are still sitting around 8,300 when we had predicted at this time it may have been 8,500. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still unclear where that's likely to go into next year. And I can't recruit staff any quicker than we're recruiting at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. That's that's very helpful indeed. OK, with that, I'm just going to open up and pass to Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, and on that note, uh, I think <laughs> Theresa Medhurst, shall I direct this to Gerry O'Donnell, because it's a finance question. Um, but <clears throat> Theresa Medhurst mentioned in her opening remarks that modelling wasn't available, I think, until six months prior to the, the particular point in time. Can you just explain, Gerry O'Donnell, uh, if it's not available until that point, how can you realistically be expected to budget uh, for what's coming up? And how much of a challenge do you think it is? Do, uh, you may not know the answer to this, but how much of a challenge do you think it would be for the Scottish Government to give you more of a lead time? Um, oh, we, so um, when we pr uh, put together our budgets, we, one of the key drivers is what's going to be the population. And yes, we have information coming from uh, the Justice Analytical, Analytical Services. Um, but we also have our own intelligence and we've got people uh, who have, over the years, and the, the years I've been with SPS, have been able to provide us with what they think is, you know, uh, what the population numbers are going to be. And they've been pretty kind of on the money, you know. Um, so we have, uh, over the last couple of years, put in figures what we estimate the population is going to be. Now, yeah, it could go up and down and we flex our budgets accordingly, but we have... Uh, 
been able to, as I say, budget pretty pretty close to the mark. And going forward into next year, we are kind of anticipating a high level of uh, a high level of prison population throughout the year. So. Theresa Meadhurst. Sorry, could I come in just on that one? I think I think Jerry's absolutely right. I think though, whilst um, from January two thousand twenty-three there was a slow steady rise, from the beginning of April this year there was a marked increase, which we had no prior notice was going to happen, and it, it, everyone really struggled to understand. We can't plan on that basis. Um, so that 200 increase in six weeks, which could happen again unpredictably, I, I have no idea it's for others to answer for that, but it's that kind of unpredictability that we're uh, dealing with at the moment and have done this financial year. And therefore it is extremely difficult to plan for a budget when we're not sure. The only thing I would say is that all through this period we have kept closely engaged with Scottish Government, made them aware of the pressures that we're experiencing but as I say, I can't retrospectively magic staff out of thin air in order to deal with those pressures. What we're doing is placing more pressure on our existing staff group, and that can only be sustained for so long. A quick, a very quick supplemental on that that you've just put into my mind. Do you know off the top of your head, Theresa Medhurst, what the capacity is of Barlini and Inverness and what the projected capacity of Glasgow and Highland will be? So the... Projected, so the capacity. This is this is where numbers, numbers of cells is not necessarily a predictor of capacity. It's about complexity. So in two thousand and nineteen, I think the prison service um, hit a peak of around just over eight thousand two hundred, and at that time, the then chief uh, chief executive indicated that he could take another 500 prisoners into the prison estate. I am not saying that five years on, because uh, the difference now is the complexity. So when somebody comes into custody, we undertake a cell share and risk assessment um, for each individual. Each individual is assessed whether or not they can share a cell and what risks are associated with that individual sharing a cell. So we could get 20 individuals into, say, Edinburgh tonight on admission. That might create 60 moves of other individuals to create the right spaces in the right locations, because legally we have to keep certain types of prisoners separate. Um, and what you're asking people to do is to, to pack up, move in with somebody else that they don't know about. It creates all sorts of tensions and pressures. But it may be that they have got 10 single cells but they still don't have sufficient capacity. And what we're doing is we are making least worst risk decisions based on the information that we have. So we will find space for people, but it may not necessarily be as safe as it would be if we had less prisoners coming into the system. So that's why I try to shy away from actual numbers, because it could be, as I say, it could have been 8,700 we could have taken in 2019, but the complexity has increased to such an extent in the last five years that I have said, because we released capacity when the children were moved out of prisons in, earlier in the summer, we've increased um, that level. But where we're sitting around about 8,300 to 8,400 is where our limitations lies. But we do have the, the numbers for... Um, Glasgow and yeah. Highland, which are increasing capacity. Yeah, the design capacity for uh, Glasgow will be 1,344, and the design capacity for Highland will be 200. I'm very grateful and uh, very interesting answer, if I may say. Uh, sticking with the capacity, uh, and so again, Gerry O'Donnell, you may wish to take this, but what was the, the there was the early release programme. Uh, recently, uh, what was the budgetary impact of that emergency release of prisoners? And is there any strategic holistic plan, as you understand it, at government level, that suggests that that situation won't arise again? Um, well, the, the budgetary impact, uh, there wasn't a, a huge amount because um, what we did was we were releasing capacity but it was to create, you know, uh, space for 
the backlog that was coming through because we were going over our kind of uh, the numbers that we were anticipating. So, uh, um, it, yes, it would. It, we I'm not able to quantify it. It would have reduced uh, some costs if we had to go a bit higher. But uh, as I say, in terms of our budget this year, um, as Theresa rightly said, we, we we've at the start of the year we identified uh, where our outturn forecast was going to be, and that's still the same as we speak today. Uh, so there's been no budgetary impact on that. Um, uh, but, 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 uh, with the, any savings, let's say, from you know, the release of prisoners, but yes, it potentially has reduced our uh, um, scope for increase. In the budget. I understand. Theresa Metters. So um, th there wasn't a budgetary figure put on that at the time. Um, what we had to do was stop other work or pause it and release capacity to other places. Um, what we did do as well, though, was, um, and this did come at a cost, um, and I don't know if we've got those figures, Jerry, but we can certainly send them. But one of the, the pressures on establishments was home detention curfew and assessments for that. So one of the things that we did was centralise that. Um, and I think it was, I think it was about £400,000, roughly, to centralise that team. Um, that eased the pressure which allowed governors more capacity to deal with things like emergency early release. However, with the, the emergency bill that's been proposed and announced by the Cabinet Secretary um, uh, for, for hopefully for next year, that will obviously go through the parliamentary process, um, we are looking at developing costings for that because that will come at a financial cost to the organisation. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'll bring in Katie Clark and then Fulton McGregor. Thank you. And I was wanting to ask about capital funding, particularly in relation to the the buildings, um, the building of the, the new prisons. I know you've already spoken about Glasgow and Highland, and as you know, there's um, a lot of pressure in relation to other prisons such as um, Greenock. So um, I know that you've got a um, an underspend in this year's capital budget of twenty five million pounds that you've. Um, mentioned in your written evidence, and I just wondered if you could confirm what you think is likely to happen in relation to that, but also if you could maybe outline the current position and in particular timescales in relation to Glasgow and Highland, and we fully understand um, the pressures because of rising building costs, but where we are with that, and um, if you could give the committee an update. I'll, I'll ask Jerry to do the, the figures. I think the position where we are with Glasgow is um, we are in we have concluded the design um, which is really positive and we were we are in um, commercially uh, sensitive discussions at the moment on the price and that will obviously then inform the time scale around um, contract signing okay. and budget availability so that that's where we are with um, Glasgow with Highland were in a much better position because obviously the contract was signed in April of this year and um, the prison is due to be concluded in terms of build around sort of August, September 2026. Um, and with regards to other prisons, uh, we do have um, capital investment in those, but the, they've not been included in the government's infrastructure investment plan. Um, so it's it's more likely than not that, that Glasgow will have to be concluded before any further investment in prison build is made. But jerry has got more detail on the figures. Yeah, OK. I, I can explain uh, how the £25 million underspend has come about. So the budget for, um, for this year, the capital budget, was arguably set a year ago, you know, and at that time we weren't into contract with either Highland or Glasgow, and we still aren't. In, as Theresa said, in contract yet with Glasgow. Um, the difficulty there is these are large projects and, you know, one month delay is a significant sum of money. And at that time, yes, we were anticipating uh, Highland to start at a certain date and how Glasgow would progress this year as well. Um, you always almost have to budget for the kind of optimum position because at the end of the day you don't want to be find yourself not having enough money so um so that initial budget uh, was kind of set but we, we you know we, we did take a bit longer getting highland signed 
Um, and that's kind of, I would say, normal for large construction projects in terms of that quite often there is a kind of delay process in agreeing the price, agreeing the terms and conditions, etc. So, um, so that has happened, and the impact is that it has kind of meant that there's been an underspend this year. Now, you know, the, the good thing is this is something that we've been able to identify very early uh, to the Scottish Government so that that capital is, can be repurposed. And, and, and we almost, I mean, right at the start of the year, you know, uh, we kind of knew that's roughly where we, we thought we might be. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was, it's almost like a, for, at the outset, we kind of thought we would be around 25 million underspent. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Fulton McGregor, then Sharon Dewey. Uh, th thanks, Convener. One of the questions I wanted to uh, ask about is something that's that's been making a bit more uh, news coverage recently, and that's about the, the change in population of the uh, of the prison estate, and particularly in relation to um, in particular in relation to maybe complex health concerns and needs that are arising. I was really interested, I think it was a wee while ago now, but in a, and I actually asked about it in the chamber that um, one of the governors, I think it was of uh, Glen Oco, perhaps, was actually suggesting that at some point in the future we might even need, um, we, we might even need uh, actually more like care institutions. But I'm wondering in terms of our, uh, of our budget scrutiny, what, what sort of uh, impact do you, do you expect um, these health and social care needs to be having directly on, on your budget? So I think, um, I'll probably say a little bit and then I'll ask Linda to come in. I think the, um, certainly we've seen an increase in social care costs and um, I think I think a 16% increase in the number of individuals over the last couple of years who have required social care costs. The other thing we have seen increasingly is people who require palliative care and people who are choosing to stay in prison rather than be transferred to hospital or to hospices for end-of-life care. Um, and the complexity around mental health needs and those who are um, experiencing substance um, issues are also increasing as well in terms of that complexity. So all of that will have implications, not just for our staff in terms of training, support um, and awareness, but also in relation to our partners, because clearly we can't undertake the, um, either the assessment of need or um, deliver the care that's required without the input of NHS colleagues and health and social care partnerships which is quite a complex landscape. But we have been working <clears throat> with the, the partners, that range of partners and Scottish Government, across a number of health um, work streams um, over recent years. Um, and I think I'll ask Linda to yeah. come. No, happy to, of course. Uh, I think it's, uh, you're absolutely right in terms of the complexity of what we're having around health, uh, social care, mental health, addictions um, and neurodiversity as well as having a real impact on how we care for um, for our residents, we are seeing, particularly in ageing populations, I think that's the, the interview that you were referring to, so with particularly the amount of um, historic sexual offences that there are that are going through the courts, we're seeing quite a lot of an, uh, an ageing population that have quite a high social care need. Our, our cost this year is over the £2 million for social care, but I would suspect that that isn't the full cost, because a lot of that is being picked up by our staff. Um, within that, um, we have a, a, obviously a lot of impact on our NHS, NHS colleagues as well, particularly around mental health that we're seeing um, significant numbers in, addiction needs from that as well. Um, and as she's indicated, uh, there are a number of um, health conditions as well that we're seeing increasing, um, uh, particularly with the older generation coming in that are requiring more health input from that as well. So that's taking up... Um, not just a lot of staff's time. I was in uh, Edinburgh yesterday and some of the staff were saying that sometimes they feel that like they are carers for some mm -hmm. of the, for the folk in our care. Um, but we're, obviously it takes up their time, but it also then, um, yeah, it's, it's com complex in terms of the, the ageing population, social care, but also particularly the, the mental health side as well, I think is really important to pick up as well from what we're seeing from people coming in and the addictions that they have. And in terms of the, the ageing population, mm -hmm. how... how much a change or a rise has that been recently? Is that, is that something that you've been able to um, put into stats or numbers? 
We do. We do have statistics. Oh, no, not on your go. <laughs> Oh, we, we do have statistics. I'm sorry, I don't have them with me, Mr McGregor, but we can write to you separately and provide those stats because we do monitor age profiles um, over years and we have seen um, an increase in the uh, number of people who are elderly, um, mm -hmm. not just... Well, we normally tend to say that for people who are coming into custody because of the um, poor health conditions that they come in with, you normally tend to age them about 10 years above where they're sitting. Um, and we've seen an increase in people who've come in who are in their 60s, 70s and 80s. And again, you know, as Linda indicated, the um, successful prosecutions around particularly historic sex abuse cases um, uh, and though as well, I think the longer sentences that we're seeing being handed out by the courts, particularly in relation to serious organised crime, mean that that population is ageing and will increase. So it is anticipated that that will continue. Okay. I'm happy to write to the committee separately. Yeah. And as the convener of the cross-party group on adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, those convictions that you've both spoke about have been. Uh, welcomed by by survivors uh, within within that community, but if, it, if this is a trend that we're going to see increasing, um, what what is the answer? And obviously, sticking to today's the purpose of today's meeting in a budget sense, what 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 is the answer to kind of deal with some of these social uh, social care and health needs for an ageing population? Is there consideration being given to you know how the estate set up almost almost having part of the a state for an older population, like you do with other, perhaps, type of offences or characteristics? So we have been looking at a range of options, um, and <clears throat> one of those options would be for some kind of facility, because you clearly don't need um, the most expensive, high secure buildings for people who have got um, social care needs. And actually what you need is something more akin to a hospital type care home facility. Um, so we had been doing undertaking work on that, but unfortunately because of the population increase this year, um, we've not been able to take that any further forward at this moment in time. But, it, but, but, but we have been scoping out options, yes. And it is something you could perhaps come back to committee on if, if further work is done. Yes, that. absolutely. Can I just add, he's okay. in, oh, in the design of Berlin, uh, HMP Glasgow, which is replacing Berlin, is there's going to be a, a special block for social care as well. Um, you know, um, blocks designed specifically for high social care needs. Okay, thanks. Looks very interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon Dowie, then Rona Mackay. Thank you. Morning. Um, specific questions in HMP command, like you'd mentioned that when you're doing your opening remarks. So it came back under SPS control on the 17th of March this year. What was the budgetary impact of the move? Will there be any further impacts going forward? And do you expect these to be covered by the Scottish Government if there are? Yeah, OK. <clears throat> so um, I think that one of the challenges is that you know, comparing um, the kind of the previous regime at Kilmarnock um, with the going forward is, is a bit more complex. Um, um, one of the things is that a yes, we this year our budget for Kilmarnock is going to be 20.8 uh, million. Um, in the last year of operation, uh, the contracted kind of price. Uh, with the, the private sector provider was about 19.8 million. But then you have to build into account uh, inflation factors this year um, that arguably may have taken that up to kind of 19.5 million. However, I think there, there's a couple of things I would um, also want to point out is there that contractual price at Kilmarnock was for 548 places. Um, we're currently operating at Kilmarnock in 596 places. So it's, uh, th there's an example of why it's, it's difficult to you know, uh, do a comparison. Um, we are going through a harmonisation process this year. It will require further costs, and that's in our budget submission. And we anticipate, uh, w with the additional costs going through, uh, that's going to take the cost from £20.8 million this year up to £23.9 million. Uh, next year. Now, as Theresa said earlier, that uh, comes with a, 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 a lot of kind of 
uh, changes in staff benefits uh, and terms and conditions. Um, one of the key changes is we, uh, going from a 40-hour week to a 35-hour week, but also, as I say, um, harmonisation with uh, SPS uh, terms and conditions. Um, so, and again, that's... Uh, but that's reflected uh, operating with a higher population as well. Um, so I think it's, so. That's the cost of running for Kilmarnock next year, and it's in our budget submission as well. Right. So, so you put in this 3.1 million in increased costs. Is that just in staffing alone? Um, it, yes, it, it is. It, it's staffing, but no, there's also probably costs and inflationary costs for food costs, etc. As well. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, there's other things. So, what would be the impact if you didn't get that? Um, I think the impact would be um, well, it's a contractual agreement with, in place. So, I think we'd have to then look at um, across the service other areas of savings. Could I come in on that? So, if the 3.1 additional uh, funding has been included in the um, submissions that we've been making to Scottish Government, the discussions that we've been having with them, so they're fully aware and fully appraised that that's our funding position for this year. Um, and we've put in full year figures for next year. Um, and that then just becomes part of the pot of money. So it's, it's not going to have any detrimental impact on one establishment in particular. It would be a detrimental impact across the whole system. Um, if we don't get the funding, because what we'd have to do is look at the distribution of funds across all of, of the organisation. If we weren't to get a specific particular part, um, it just forms part of the same pot. <clears throat> I suppose in the previous panel we'd heard about them, like reform of, of um, their systems and everything. One of the biggest costs you've obviously got in Kilmarnock is the increase in staff costs. Were there any learnings or best practice or anything from the, the way it was operated in Kilmarnock that you took to the SPS so that you could actually save money within the rest of the, the estate? So as part of that harmonisation piece, um, there is um, ongoing um, consideration, but obviously we weren't on the ground in Kilmarnock to understand how they operated until March. So we, we have from March obviously been... Um, looking at their systems processes and that learning will be migrated into SPS once we're clear about it, but that's still an ongoing process. And the focus and priority has really been, um, we had agreed um, as part of the Scottish Government um, position that we would move to a 35-hour working week uh, on the 1st of December, which Kilmarnock staff were obviously very keen to do as well. Um, so the focus has really been to get us to a harmonisation position on terms and conditions, including that 35-hour week for the 31st of December. But the intention will still be to focus on that learning to see whether or not there are efficiencies or savings that we can transfer from Kilmarnock to other parts of the SPS. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, William Carr, you'd like to come in maybe with a supplementary. Just very briefly on Kilmarnock, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> I understand that when it was privately run, officers at HMP Kilmarnock had body-worn cameras and they were dedicated drug sniffer dogs. Um, <clears throat> was the SPS given budget to continue to provide those or have you had to change that provision because you haven't got budget to maintain it? So... <clears throat> um, the, the, as I understand it, the drug dogs are much happier because they've got a new van, they've got better accommodation, so they're still in place and they're settled. Those staff are still there. Um, with regard to the body-worn cameras, they were um, obviously Circo's equipment. They were coming to the end of their shelf life. We were undertaking a pilot within SPS anyway. We have three establishments, Lomos, Berlini and um, Perth, where we are piloting our own body-worn camera system, um, which is much more modern. Um, and um, when that pilot's complete, we will obviously have to make a budget submission to Scottish Government um, for full funding for body-worn cameras if it's successful. Um, but so far, the early signs are that it's having an impact on, on staff safety, which is good. Very grateful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Um, good afternoon. 
Um, I wanted to go back a wee bit to um, the issue of uh, prison population and capacity. And I, I'm, I'm just curious to know whether you think maybe a whole system approach is going to be needed here. And I'm thinking uh, specifically on alternatives to custody. Um, do you think that that is a solution and is there enough um, provision for that at the moment? So I think, um, you know, from from what we all know, that um, in terms of, of community provision, the, um, the position in uh, other parts of the public and third sector is patchy um, across, across Scotland and um, a lot of services and communities are under pressure as well. And I know that was one of the concerns that came through the consultation that Scottish Government undertook on long-term prisoners um, earlier in the summer was the capacity to respond to more people coming out of prison early. Um, but there, for, certainly from, from my perspective, um, were there to be more consistency and um, greater capacity, then clearly more people could then benefit from community-based alternatives to custody. Mm -hmm. And we know from research and evidence that those are more effective mm -hmm. than certainly um, periods on remand or short-term sentences. Yeah. Um, so I, th I definitely have been advocating not just the whole system approach, but that perspective. What's been really welcome recently um, is because of the, the steep rise in population this year. There's been much more forensic look at some of the things that have been happening um, across justice. And, for example, just as social work colleagues have been looking in particular, I know this is an area of interest for you, Ms Mackay, mm -hmm. um, at the women who are on remand in, in um, Stirling in particular, mm -hmm. to look um, at whether or not there are um, alternatives there that could, mm -hmm. alternative services that could have been in place to support those women. That work's still ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that shifted significantly from last year was the number of people who are failing to attend court mm -hmm. has significantly increased, and there was a 100% increase in warrants issued for those kinds of offences um, in the first six months of this year compared to last year. Mm -hmm. So those are things we really need to better understand yeah. okay. because those are things that are definitely driving an increase in the prison population. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I also wanted just to flag about through care, and you did mention that earlier as well, and the difficulties with that given the size of the population. So MI, HMIPS have said in their written submission to us um, that greater provision will be made available via community justice and the third sector. Um, and I'm just wondering how confident you are that that could could be part, a part solution to the problems you're experiencing with through care. Um, through care services make a significant difference to people mm -hmm. coming out of custody. Mm -hmm. um, very often those coming out are still in very chaotic states. They're disconnected from their communities um, and they have a range of needs and a complexity of needs uh, that requires a range of services and inputs to support them. So any kind of through care service definitely makes an impact. Third sector have had significant success in that regard um, and certainly when we had the service in place within the SPS it helped us gain a better understanding of the kinds of difficulties and problems that people faced on returning yeah. to communities. Yeah. So without a doubt that kind of, I think we are, we are if, I, if I, I can be quite frank, where I see there is a bit of a gap at the moment is around those on remand, because we know that since the pandemic, people have been spending longer on remand. Um, it can be for a period of up to two years. Mm -hmm. They can be as disconnected from their communities and from services as other people. Mm -hmm. um, but we have still got um, quite high levels of unplanned liberations every week from custody, and there is no support in place for those people who then land on the streets. Yeah, well, I, can, I can see that, that that would be a huge issue, and I think with through care, it, it, it would help stop the revolving door of people Absolutely coming, coming back in. Yes. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. I'm just going to bring back in mm -hmm. Liam Kerr, if you're wanting to bring in another follow-up question. We it, do have time. It, well, very good. Uh, it was only <laughs> a, a very short thing, Theresa Medhurst, because you mentioned uh, your employee safety 
uh, and rightly so earlier on. Uh, I am led to believe that recent statistics suggest that there's been a rise in attacks on officers uh, in the estate. Have you got any detail on why that might be happening? Is it perhaps due to the overcrowding? We've explored the complex needs that Fulton McGregor was exploring, the increased number of sex offenders and organised crime gangs in your estate is, was in your submission. Uh, and crucially, what funding do you need to see in this budget which would allow you to address it properly? It's <clears throat> a very good question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Kerr. And, uh, a really complex one because I think we have seen, seen in, as with any population rise in numbers, you see increases in violence and, and other factors such as safety. Um, because of the pressured nature, you're, you've got more people in the same amount of space and tensions rise, pressures rise, people become less tolerant. Um, but if you overlay that with the increase in serious or organised crime gangs, and we have seen increased credible threats to our staff over the last year or two, you overlay that again with the type of substances that are coming into our prisons. Um, those substances, mainly benzodiazepines and psychoactive substances, and it's the same experience in communities, and I'm sure our colleagues in Police Scotland would say the same, um, that when people are taking these, their behaviour becomes really unpredictable. Um, they can become quite violent towards staff and actually don't realise that's the way they're behaving, but very quickly then lapse into unconsciousness um, and staff don't then know what they're dealing with in terms of trying to save somebody's life and bringing them back round and they be, then become violent again. Um, so it, the, the environment that staff are working in at the moment is incredibly unpredictable. Body-worn cameras, I think, are definitely a way of improving that safety. In addition to that, um, further investment in our IT systems and technology, because staff are, some staff have to be tied to a desk because we've got desk-based PCs that they still work from. Um, whereas if we had um, equipment that they could carry around with them to help them undertake their tasks, give them immediate access to information, input information and data at a time when it's convenient to them, then it gives them more freedom to be doing more of the work that they could be doing. So I think there are a range of factors where investment would be particularly um, helpful. Um, and there are other things that we are obviously intent on exploring around um, the information flow between ourselves and Police Scotland, how that can be improved, etc. So there are enhancements in areas that we can work to improve on. But I think whilst the, um, whilst the increase has been steady over a period of time, particularly um, over the last year or two, nevertheless, I think that complexity is the one that's really causing the greatest level of concern. Um, and, it, you know, another factor I mentioned earlier was drone activity. We've seen that increase by over 150% in the first six months of this year, um, which is unprecedented. Um, so, again, there will be um, investment required in drone detection equipment and potentially other types of equip equipment as well, because I wouldn't want to just detect when a drone is coming over our um, over our establishments. Um, I'd want to prevent that as well. <clears throat> Sorry. And, and, and is that, uh, th thank you for the depth of the answer, is that sufficiently factored into your budget request such that if you were to get it, that allows you to take those remedial steps? If you weren't to get it, then that would provide challenges to addressing the problem that you've raised. Absolutely, that's correct. That's, uh, that's why, I mean, <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad nobody here has fallen off their seat when I mentioned the figure, 56, over 56 million, it is a significant amount of money, but it doesn't just belie the, the overall inflationary and cost pressures, it does um, also factor in those complexity pressures as well. I understand. Very grateful. Okay, thank, you. thank you. 
I've just got a couple of questions I'm interested in picking up on from um, the submission um, from HMIPS. And you, Theresa Metters, you touched on um, Castle Huntley earlier on, I think, uh, in your earlier evidence. And I note that in the recently published thematic review on progression, um, there was reference to uh, significant improvements being required in individualised case management and in training and development of staff if people in prison are to progress to less secure uh, conditions, uh, such as um, Castle Huntley, in preparation for release, so thereby sort of optimising the benefits of the underused capacity. Are there sort of specific kind of blockages or are there challenges in and around, for example, staff training and development that are adding to this that, from a budgetary point of view, um, are, are of interest to the committee? Absolutely. I would agree with that, convener. Um, thank you for that. <clears throat> so, obviously, as with every other public sector organisation, um, the pandemic paused and halted a lot of our ability to undertake mm -hmm. training. Um, and so coming out of that, and we were still recruiting staff to high levels, we were still able to do that. Um, what that means then is that we have fallen behind with a training activity in some critical areas, including progression. There are some areas of good practice, is what I would say, particularly um, HMP shots, um, as well as the open estate, and they are migrating the, the work that they are doing and trying to share that across the estate. But we need the capacity <coughs> to be able to release staff for training. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we need to have sufficient space within the system. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have that at the moment. So to release staff for training purposes, even for things like control and restraint, health and safety, is a challenge at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, so things like progression, unfortunately, when you're looking at safety, must come first. And although progression, of course, is a priority, and we fully accepted the recommendation in the report from HMIPS, and nevertheless, um, clearly safety and security come first. Yeah, uh, yeah please come in. Just for some of the, the stats, we have been doing quite a lot of work to try and focus on that, particularly around the population pressures. And so we have seen targeted work around progression. We've seen both... Um, uh, the two female custody units, mm -hmm. so Lilies is sitting full at the moment, 100%, and Bella at 75% full. So we are seeing women moving through the system, and we're also seeing Castle Huntley is almost up at 80%. So we are starting to be able to move people through that progression system. But as Theresa indicated also in uh, the opening comments, we have a team working on our case management programme to try and make that more risk-based and personalised. But that is something that is taking time and has been impacted by, by pressures as well, but so that we can focus on that. Okay, that, that, that's really interesting. And I was actually going to pick up on um, just the situation with the community custody units that you've, you've just mentioned. But I think what, what you're describing is a real need for and, and the importance of probably quite specialist training, um, depending on where staff are deployed and the roles and responsibilities that they have. And as you say, that presumably is quite a significant abstraction from day-to-day -day business that you've got to cover, both in terms of managing the workforce, but in terms of covering the cost of that. Um, and, and that's a really important aspect of managing the prison population going forward, in particular, given the challenges around numbers at the moment. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think the other thing <clears throat> that I would say on this as well, convener, is that um, we've spoke about the range of complex needs that individuals mm -hmm. have. So that individualised case management approach is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, if you're dealing with somebody who's neurodivergent, for example, um, you know, that belies a whole raft of, of you know, individualised issues to that person that, that staff need to understand and work through and help manage. Um, so there are not just the, the issues around a risk and needs-based approach to case management in order to help somebody with their criminogenic needs mm -hmm. and work their way through their progression. But there are also the raft of other issues that can also um, 
make the cases far more complex, that staff need to have awareness of as well in order to better support them, better inform them in the work that, that they're doing. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot more that we could and should be doing, but I think it is very challenging when we're struggling to just have staff on, on the ground doing the work that they need to do, mm -hmm. um, regardless of, of the other pressures that we're experiencing. Okay, thank you. If there's no more questions from anybody, then I think in the interests of your voice and your your, your vocal cords, um, I think we'll bring this session uh, to a close. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your time. That's been a really interesting session uh, and we'll just have a short suspension to allow our witnesses to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. So our next item of business this morning is to consider a paper from the clerk on revisions to the Scottish Government's revised national performance framework and national outcomes. And uh, can I refer members to paper three? So can I just ask members if you have any comments that you wish to make uh, or are you content that we note uh, the developments uh, in and around the review of the national performance framework? Anyone want to make any comments? No? No? Okay, thank you very much. In that case, that completes our business in public today. And we now move into private session. Thank you.